Hi, everyone. This is Samantha Farley with Type 1 Tribe, an interview series with T1D leaders all across the world. Today, our guest is Lissy Pointer, a diabetes health coach who also lives with type 1 diabetes herself. Thanks for being here, Lissy. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Of course. So tell us a little bit about you. Like, where are you from? Where do you live now? Yeah, so I'm born and raised New Jersey, um, East Coaster. <laughs> I was uh, diagnosed with diabetes myself when I was 19, so a little bit later in life. And yeah, outside of that, I'm a fiance, a dog mom, and I do health coaching for type one diabetics like myself. Oh, I love it. So do you still live in Jersey? Yep. Yep. I was born here. Um, I moved out briefly for college and about a year after that, but moved back home. Got to gotta stick with your roots. <laughs> you love it. That's good for you. I, I had to get out immediately from Ohio. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it makes sense when I say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I went to Penn State and our rivals are Ohio State. So whenever anybody says Ohio, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I am an Ohio State fan, but I didn't go to Ohio State, so we're good. Okay, we can still be friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you were diagnosed at age 19? Yep. Yeah, so I was a freshman at Penn State at that point, mm -hmm. and yeah, I had come down with the flu a little bit earlier in January. Um, it was like the first time I'd ever really gotten sick like that, but it was also the first year I didn't get my flu shot. So when you're on campus with like 40,000 people, I guess it made sense. And a few weeks later, started noticing all of the classic symptoms of being really thirsty, having to use the bathroom a lot. I, you know, my vision was going, um, all those things. And as soon as I went to the doctors, luckily they knew what to test for. I was very blessed in that way. As you hear a lot of stories of people, you know, older who they don't automatically test for type one because it's so known as the juvenile diabetes. Um, but yeah, pretty much right off the bat, they checked my blood sugar, they checked for ketones and came out right away and said, yeah, you have, you have type one diabetes. Wow. That's crazy. So were you in the hospital? I actually was not. They gave me the option. They said, Hey, you can stay like, we can send you to the ER. You can get on insulin today, or, you know, we'll set up an endocrinologist appointment for you tomorrow, but like you have to show up right away so they can get you on insulin. And, you know, me being, 19 with a social life. I was like, I have plans for later. So like, I'll come back tomorrow. And they're like, okay, just like eat low carb for tonight so that, you know, your blood sugars don't go too crazy without insulin. And um, so they actually didn't admit me. Were you so overwhelmed? Like, I feel like if somebody would have told me to eat low carb, I'd be like, okay, like, so don't eat pizza. Like, Right. Honestly, like it's kind of embarrassing, but I didn't know really what carbs were at that point. I remember I had a friend who was in dietetics or she, she was, we were freshmen, so she wasn't in her major yet, but I knew that she was going for nutrition. I'm like, what is low carb? Like, what should I be looking for on these packages? And she's like, maybe get a salad for dinner. Like, She really couldn't help me, but I was like, I don't really know what to expect here. Jeez. I mean, I'm happy you got in the next day because yeah, that could have been tragic. <laughs> yeah, especially with endocrinologists, like that's very, I was very lucky. And yeah, you know, you just hear all those voices in your ear too. Like my family, we were like, no, like you can't be diabetic, Like that doesn't run in our family. And then you have those people who are telling you just give up gluten and wheat and like, you'll be able to cure yourself. And, you know, then you have the people who are like, don't let them put you on insulin because then you're dependent on it. And I had no idea, like, you know, all those voices going in your head and I had to kind of filter through those with the help of my endo. You know, I went in the next day kind of hopeful and I was like, maybe, maybe they miss something. Like maybe they're just assuming that my blood sugars are high and like, I need to go and fast it or whatever it is. But she's like, no, like your blood sugars were 438. Like you, you're type one, you have type one diabetes. This isn't reversible. Um, you'll be insulin dependent for the rest of your life. And I think that's when it really hit. And that's when the overwhelm was like, oh my gosh, like this is lifelong. And that's crazy. Just going to like the doctor, like I was at least admitted to the hospital. So I knew it was serious, but like, if someone just told me to go to the doctor, I'd be like, wait, <laughs> hold on. Like, you're telling me that I have now have like a life threatening condition. I don't know. I feel like that would have been harder to accept by not going to a hospital. Yeah. And, and they had told me like, you'll be going on insulin, but I didn't know really what that meant. I'm like, is that a pill? Is that like, I inject myself one time and then I'm good. Like, I didn't really know, okay, no, this is, I have to do this, you know, at the time with MDI, like once a day. And then every time I ate, I, I, it's just so much to grasp when you know nothing about diabetes in general. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. 
how was your endocrinologist? Is it a girl, male? It was a, yeah. So I actually saw an NP or, or no, sorry, a PA, a physician assistant, and she was amazing. She like was so she held my hand through the whole thing. She's like, you know, she was very she leveled with me a lot because again, I came in with kind of that that blind hope of like maybe they miss something. Um, and I, I've after about like a few years, I actually went on Facebook and found her and I like messaged her. I'm like, Hey, like, I just want to let you know that like, you really changed my life. And, you know, in a really horrible time, you were a really grounding uh, voice. Um, so I, I met with her and then obviously she had her endo uh, above her to, you know, formally diagnose me, but yeah, I mostly communicated with her and then the CDE. Oh, well, I'm glad you had a good experience. Cause I know a lot of people who did not. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your experience like? Well, I had to go to the hospital and I was there for like two days, um, but immediately they actually, so kind of a long story, but they immediately gave, like sent me a diabetes educator who like literally was telling me like, my life is over. You're never going to be able to have kids, like all of this stuff. And I, it was so bad. I just started bawling my eyes out. It was, it was terrible. So uh -huh. she was like 85 years old. So I think I don't know. Like she just didn't know a lot about the new stuff that's out or mm -hmm. something, but it, it was terrible. So, wow. I'm so sorry. That's it, it's such like, yeah, all the outdated advice coming in. It's, it's so hard when you miss the two, it's almost like two different worlds now. Yeah. And it it's just, it was within the first five minutes of me getting the, to the hospital too. So I'm like, what is going on? Like what disease is diabetes? Like I didn't even understand, but I, think I just got here. <laughs> yeah, Seriously. <laughs> So they put you on MDI when you were first diagnosed. How long were you on MDI? I was on MDI for about six months. I pretty much knew right away that it wasn't for me because I kind of took the route. I just hated the injections. I wasn't good at them. I didn't like remember on time to take my long, long acting. And I was very much like I hated injecting so much that I would almost avoid eating. And at that point, I had known like, all right, this isn't healthy to, you know, only have one or two meals a day. Like I need something that makes this a little bit easier. So from there, um, after about six months, I was home for the summer and went to my endo here and uh, transitioned onto the Omnipod. And that, I've been on that ever since. So it's been about eight and a half years on the Omnipod. And you love it. I love it. Yeah. I'm still on the original, like the arrows, like the very old school, like remote one. <laughs> I get a lot of funny <laughs> looks, but <laughs> I like it. That's amazing. I'm still on MDI. So, and, but if I were to switch to a pump, I'd go on Omnipod. So I'm always like curious to hear about it. So like, what do you love about it specifically? I, my, my initial attraction was that it's tubeless. So, you know, of course being young adult, as in you know, college wearing my crop tops and stuff. And just, I wanted that freedom and that's like the flexibility of not having something connected to me. It just didn't, it, that was like my number one preference. Um, now I just love like all the features of the pump. I don't have the auto mode tools yet. I'll, you know, eventually switch to the Omnipod 5, but I like being in control. I like seeing, you know, what my actions, what reactions that's causing my blood sugars. Um, but yeah, the, off the bat, it was the tubeless that really did it for me. And you switch it every three days, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I just did a, yeah, site change last night. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just curious, what's your favorite low snack? What's your go-to low snack? Ooh. Okay. Like the one that probably I have two. So the one, the, the really like easy one is always like those go-go squeeze, like applesauce ones. And what, like, I feel like a five-year-old when I have them because I'm like toddlers have these. Um, so those are like the most effective. I feel like they just like, it's a perfect amount. Always get me right up. My guilty pleasure one is always like ice cream. Like when me and my fiance are in bed watching a movie and I'm low, I'm like, I just show him the number and he's like, okay. And he gets up and gets the ice cream. It doesn't work as well. And sometimes, you know, you overdo it a little bit, but has to go with those two. Yeah. So I was going to say, cause I usually just go to glucose tablets. Cause I just think it's easy. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to kick in in 15 minutes. So like, do you notice that ice cream takes longer to kick in? It definitely does. And honestly, like at that point, then you have to, like you get caught up in, okay, now I have to dose for this. If I'm having more than like the 15 carbs and then that comes, you know, it gets just gets tricky with the timing and how much you're eating. So that's why it's not always the most efficient one, but it's, sometimes it does a trick. Well, I mean, that's how it is with like chocolate chip cookies. It's the same way. I'm like, wait, I have to have like 30 minutes of leeway time. Right. Yeah. So probably not the best for when you're like 45, but maybe one like, you know, 70 or 80. <laughs> have you ever had like a really bad low experience? 
I haven't had one where I've become like unconscious or anything. I'm very blessed with that. I've always kind of felt my lows. Now with the depths calm, it just, um, I catch them a lot quicker. I have had some scary ones. I actually just recorded a podcast with my best friend and we were just talking about um, one night New Year's Eve when, you know, you're mixing drinking along with, um, you know, movement. And then, you know, I just kind of like fell asleep after and I didn't wake up to my alarms and all of my friends were waking up to my alarm. So they're like, let's see, like, you should probably get up and check this. And I was just like, no, no, like, it's fine. Like not even realizing what I was saying. Um, luckily, like I woke up in the morning, I was fine, but it was definitely alarming of, oh, I was at like 40 all night and I didn't even get up to check or like have a juice. So I would definitely say that was like the scariest moment of that. I didn't even realize it. Was that like right when you were diagnosed? It was actually a few years, I want to say three or four years after that. So that's scary. Yeah. And I had been living in Miami at the time. So I was, you know, far away from home. Luckily, my dad followed my dad's calm share just in the, I was living alone. So it was just like a precaution. But that moment was really like the next morning. He's like, I tried calling you and like your friends were there. Like, that's really scary. Like, what is our game plan for if this happens in the future? So luckily, like I lived in a like a condo where there's like a lot of other other apartments, there's security downstairs. Um, so we kind of made a game plan of like, if I don't, if I don't answer you after the first or second time that you call, like that's, you're okay to call the security and, and like knock on my door. It's, uh, it's so awful that that's even a thing, you know, like that we even have to worry about things like that, but we yeah. don't. Right. And it, it's kind of like, not, I was like, Oh, that'll never happen to me. I have the, I have the debts, Tom. I I'm very like aware of my numbers that, but it happens. Yeah, that's crazy. So tell us about your coaching business. How did you get into that? Yeah, so um, we have a coaching business, Needles and Spoons Health and Wellness. I always get a lot of questions about that name. So I um, love it. <laughs> about four years after I was diagnosed with diabetes, I was also diagnosed with Crohn's. Um, and that's when I really started looking into like I started noticing that more of the impact of stress and my environment and my relationships. And again, this is when I was living away from home. So just all those different things like, okay, this is impacting how I feel internally as far as like my Crohn's and like the flares that I'm having. And I'm also seeing that impact on my blood sugars. My A1C was pretty much in like the sevens, which not not bad at all, but I felt it just in like, I was spiking to 300 and going down to like 50 every day. And I'm like, there has to be more to this than anybody's telling me. Cause like my endo is telling me I'm doing great because I have a low risk A1C, but I feel awful. <laughs> so, um, that year I kind of started taking more of a holistic approach. I moved, I, I, I ended up moving from Miami back to New Jersey, um, moved home with my family, got in a better relationship. I'm actually still in that relationship. We're getting married in June. Um, <laughs> and you know just started taking more of those like holistic when you think of holistic like just more of your overall wellness taking care of your overall body and mental health and I started noticing with that along with paying attention to like what are the foods that I'm giving myself doing to my blood sugars like how are the different macronutrients helping me how are my workouts supporting my body um, the cycle component when I started looking at all those other factors and not focusing on restriction because again, I was in a mentality of like, I can't eat this because it's either going to cause me pain from the Crohn's or I'm going to have a high blood sugar. So instead of feeling restricted, I was like, I felt more empowered by all these different variables. And I noticed that my A1C went from a 7.1 to a 5.7. And in that process, my Crohn's also went into remission, which it's been for the past four or five years. So- wow. I was like, there's, there's so much more to this, these conditions than our doctors are even telling us. And I know that other people need this support because they want to feel, you know, it's not just about the blood sugars. It's not just about the diabetes. It's about how can I make these things coexist with my life? Um, so now we have a whole coaching practice kind of based off of that, that, uh, you know, that narrative instead of more empowering narrative. And so we have our signature program, which is called Keeping It 100, um, no pun intended. And uh, that, that's just where we have, you know, a full panel of coaches between myself. Um, I coach more on like lifestyle. I'm a personal trainer. Um, we have a women's wellness coach and a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. So we team up and support our clients in kind of taking a more empowered approach to their management. 
Wow, that's amazing. And I'm sorry to hear about all that stuff that's happened to you. It's it's crazy how it all happens like quickly too, like all within like a few years. It's yeah. Just, um, but it's great that you're turning it into an amazing business and offering for other people. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's very weird. Like, you know, you have 19 healthy years and all of a sudden in your mid twenties. And it's very weird too, because I was diagnosed with diabetes February 17th of 2014. And then fast forward to 2018. Um, it was February 14th of 2018 that I was diagnosed with Crohn's. So same month, same week. It's very weird. That's creepy. And like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. And just, so it was a year current, like time. Um, it was within four years. So 2014 oh. and 2018. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. That's awful. But I'm, <laughs> I, that's so good that you haven't had it for four years. Yeah. I got very, like, you know, I take very much the blend between, um, you know, the, the med medication that I take works for me, but also I think the lifestyle components, I, I take that blend and I'm very lucky. And to say that I've been in remission, I'm hoping it stays that way. And yeah. So if you can talk about this, I know it's part of your coaching practice, but like, do you, what do you typically do for like, do you follow a certain diet or how does that work? We are, and we're very anti-diet in a sense of you have to follow XYZ. I've tried it. I've tried, um, you know, the low carb diet. I've tried the anti-inflammatory diet. Um, and all those just felt too, it backed me into a corner too much. I, f I felt too restricted by thinking what I can eat versus what I can't eat. So instead, we teach our clients kind of the same approach that we take in the sense of how can we give you the nutrition information and, and strategy in the sense of if you're having a low carb, high protein meal, how is that different if you have a high carb, high fat meal? Because I don't believe that you'll never be in this situation where you can completely avoid those meals, um, whether you're having a birthday cake at your you know, niece's birthday party, that happens to me quite often, or you're having pizza or whatever it is, um, you know, because food is so, food is everything. Food is cultural, food is social. Like there's so much more than just following a diet. So we just say, how can we take the information and how it affects our blood sugar to adjust our strategy so that when those situations come up, whatever, you know, and whatever preferences that you have, how can you feel empowered in that situation? That's amazing. And I, I agree with that completely because sometimes like some weeks I will be sort of following a low carb diet, not really on purpose. You know, I'm just like trying to eat healthier and mm -hmm. my blood sugars are usually amazing, but then I'm also like, man, I miss pizza. Like, so it's silly that to, if you want to follow that, that's great, but it's kind of silly at the same time. Cause you're right. It's like, it brings people, pizza brings people together and all of those things. So yeah, I think that's wonderful. Right. Exactly. I just don't think that you can avoid everything forever. And we have a saying of like, if you don't eat the cupcake, you'll never know how to bowls for the cupcake. So I would rather eat something 20 times and figure out how to bowls for it than completely avoid it. But maybe that's my Virgo personality. No, I, I agree with you. Oh, speaking of Virgo, we have the same birthday. No way. September 9th. Yeah, that's I remember awesome. one time on Instagram, you posted about it. I was like, no way, we have the same birthday. Wait, I love that. Oh, so you you definitely know the Virgo style. <laughs> I mean, it's the most common birthday in like the world, so. Is it actually? Yeah, I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> what year were you born? I was 1991. So I'm a few okay, years so older than you, I think. Yeah, three but, years, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> crazy oh, though, we share a birthday, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. My my brother is the 10th, but he's nine years older. So okay. like, I, I was almost on his birthday. I missed it by like two hours. That's crazy. Yeah, I have I have two other people in like my family that have the same birthday too as September 9th. So it's just- Oh, wow. Birthday. I don't know. <laughs> that is wild. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in your opinion, like what do you think the future of diabetes is or what it's what is it going to be? Ooh, yeah, I love this question. I definitely think that coaching is going to be a, a normal part of diabetes care at some point. I think at some point we're going to notice because the, the endocrinology system or healthcare system is at a deficit right now. There are not enough endocrinologists to keep up with how many people live with diabetes on top of the other um, endocrine, endocrine conditions. So I think at some point the healthcare system is going to catch wind that diabetes coaching it needs to bridge that gap in between appointments. And eventually we'll start seeing a lot more coaching being, being normalized in, you know, at diagnosis, like how can you become paired up with a coach for in between your appointments or how can you be referred out to different programs, whether it's ours or somebody else's. 
Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that happens soon. Um, you know, even just as far as like the ADA, hopefully that will become a part of their, um, just normal, you know, conversations that they're having as well. Uh, so I definitely see that happening. I also think that the technology is going to start taking a lot of the decision-making away, but we're in a position right now where the, the technology is doing that as long as we understand the technology and we're at this weird balance where we have to know what it's doing and we have to be really confident in our decision-making and our behaviors and the settings in the tech. So we're not quite there just yet, but it's really, I'm curious to see what happens in the future as far as like the the looping and um, how those how those technologies work. No, me too. It's crazy. I mean, e- even if you just look over the past 10 years, like the changes of technology is absolutely amazing. So 10 more years from now, it's going to be even better. So that's, that's great. And I completely agree about the coaching. We all have our own opinions, but like endocrinology, as you know, is like so focused on just like the, the numbers, the like education aspect of diabetes. So I love that you actually have diabetes and you can talk about the lifestyle portion of it. Cause if, if our endocrinologists aren't diabetic, they don't really know and they never will. So. Yeah. And it's very, they're very straightforward in like, you know, just take your insulin, count your carbs and you're good. But we know living with it, we're like, no, diabetes is a part of every decision that we make. Like right now I can, you know, you and I are probably subconsciously thinking about it. Like, oh, should I check my phone to see what my blood sugar is? Do I have enough insulin on board? Am I going high from the adrenaline? Like we know that there's so much more to those different pieces that just aren't talked about in a 20 minute conversation every three to six months. Right. Right. I know. I totally agree. So sadly, more and more people are getting diagnosed with diabetes. So like, what's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody newly diagnosed? Oh man. Yeah. This is, I I always think of like what I would want to hear at that point. Um, I think my number one piece of advice would be use it as an opportunity to get curious. I think we off the bat kind of get that we we are we're so complacent with the narrative that our doctors are giving us of you can still live a completely normal life just you know take your insulin count your carbs which is true you can live a completely normal life but i think there's more reason to like dive in deeper of of understanding your body and using it as a i feel healthier now than i ever have living with diabetes and crohn's and i think that's just a like it's just a fa- an outcome of getting to know my body and learn more about it and get curious about it rather than judging it for what it can't do. So I, I think it's important to go through that grieving process and be, be angry, be, be pissed off at the diagnosis. But, you know, when you kind of take that time, use it as a reason to get curious and ease the judgment a bit. That's great. And yeah, look at you. You've come far. You didn't know what a carb was. And now you're talking about carbs. <laughs> now I can look at something. I'm like, oh, that's 40. <laughs> Seriously. It, it is true. Like you learn so much about nutrition because you have to, and it, you learn it so quickly. And so, I mean, it, there are benefits to out of it for sure. Yeah. I, don't get me wrong. It's, it's still, it sucks. Like you have those days all, you know, they happen. I just, again, last week I had, I had COVID and my blood sugar would not come down under like 270 when it finally did it would go right back up like that's frustrating that's adding complexities onto an already annoying <laughs> scenario going on but more often than not i find that the things that i've gotten out of it outweigh those brief moments absolutely well thanks so much for being here how do people get in touch with you if they want to meet you yeah. And thank you for having me. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at needles and spoons underscore. You can visit needles and spoons.com. And we also have a podcast, keeping at 100 radio uncensored diabetes conversations. So those will be your main spots. Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and we'll see you guys later. Thank you.